The information on this week's episode comes from two main sources. A description of the Dybbuk box for eBay by Kevin Manis from Genius.com and The Haunted Dybbuk Box by Brian Dunning for Skeptoid Podcast, episode number 428, released on August the 19th, 2014. The links for all of these sources are in the description of this episode. Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Real Life Ghost Stories. To kick things off today, we are going to be saying thank you to our gorgeous Patreon pledgers. Thank you to Susie Q. To Paddy McEaton. To Jessica Heng. To Gracie Batista. And to Anya Stozik. So thank you all so much for your generous donations to our Patreon. Remember, if you would like to donate to our Patreon page, you can donate by going to patreon.com forward slash Real Life Ghost Stories and for as little as five dollars a month you get four extra episodes a month which is quite a nice little deal Kushdi. our review this week is the possession the possession was released in 2012 it has an imdb rating of 5.9 out of 10 and a rotten tomatoes rating of 40 percent would you like a little synopsis uh no not today no of course yeah. oh i was really <laughs> taken aback i was like oh what? well i don't know what to do now i've written one down Based on a true story, The Possession is the terrifying account of how one family must unite in order to survive the wrath of an unspeakable evil. Clyde, played by Geoffrey Dean Morgan, and Stephanie Brennick, played by Kira Sedgwick, see little cause for alarm when their youngest daughter, Em, becomes oddly obsessed with an antique wooden box she purchased at a yard sale. But as Em's behaviour becomes increasingly erratic, the couple fears the presence of a malevolent force in their midst, only to discover that the box was built to contain a dybbuk, a dislocated spirit that inhabits and ultimately devours its human host. What were your thoughts on this one? I actually quite liked it. I actually thought it was better than it was going to be, which was interesting. This is probably the film I've liked the most recently. Why did you think it was not going to be very good? Because I'd never heard of it. Normally stuff comes across my radar, even if we don't watch it immediately. And when you said that this is what we were watching this week, I was a bit like, what now? And then when I saw the, the screen on Netflix, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. But it was actually, 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 actually quite good. I thought, I quite liked it. Do you know, it was fine. That's what <laughs> I think of it. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't brilliant. It was just fine. You see, what I liked about it was that it wasn't like over-reliant on ridiculous CGI to make it scary. No, I that's felt true. like it was quite... Like, everything that they did in the build, apart from right at the end, which I don't know whether we'll talk about because it's a bit of a spoiler, but everything else was fairly well done. Like, the bugs coming out of the girl's mouth, the fingers coming out the back of the throat, all that stuff was quite well done. It was quite well shot as a film. I liked the lighting and the and the angles and the way that they used the sound. And I quite liked it. And the story kind of made sense if you had no sort of understanding of what that kind of thing is. But if you were like knocking around like a antiques fair or um, a yard sale or something like that and you saw an interesting box and you didn't really have any sort of background now i wouldn't personally because you know i'm scared of everything but if you're just a normal human being and you found a box you'd probably open it wouldn't you so so the story makes sense in that terms in that sense and if you couldn't open it you'd want to open it more yeah absolutely particularly if you could hear there was something inside it yeah if something's rattling about inside it so i actually thought it was quite good i thought the, the the main girl was quite a good actress the little girl yeah. She's quite freaky looking. The stepdad was a real... Knob. I- yep, idiot. And uh, made you want to hate him. And the only thing I didn't really like about it was I thought it would have been a better film without all the family drama. Well, it's very Hollywoodized in that regard, yeah. isn't it? I mean, the, the there's like obviously the possession overtone and then the undertone is, will they or won't they get back together and will they pull together for the kids? Yeah. Which is obviously a Hollywood trope, isn't it? Is that Steven Spielberg yeah. divorced families type thing but yeah it was fine i mean it like i didn't find it very scary but i did like the jewish mythology yeah, i don't I know i don't know much about jewish mythology and the dibic, the right word uh folklore i don't really know demonology yeah maybe maybe that's demonology is a better word nice about it because you're so used to catholic demonology and possession exorcism and exorcism and yeah it's quite good to see the jewish and the best thing about it was matt Shaw. Matt Jaffe was in it who is someone I remember from a long time ago being this like orthodox reggae star and he's actually plays the, the young 
orthodox priest, not priest, rabbi, ends up getting the demon back in the box, so to speak. The demon that looks like baby Voldemort. Did look like baby Voldemort. And considering how much trouble he put the family through, he did essentially just get back into the box when he was told. Yeah, it was like, get back into the box. And he was like, oh, fine. Yeah, just like climbed out of the guy and into the box. After all that time. And then got his revenge. But But after all that time, like yeah, after no. all that absolute trauma the family went through, and then he's like, fine, I'll get back in the box. But then life rattling around in that box must be really boring. Yeah. It's so true. it's no wonder the thing, whatever it is, gets out and goes rogue. Yeah, well, the thing he was put in the box in the first place, because he's trying to find a host. You understand what he's going for, I guess. So what would you give it out of five? I'd actually give it four, you know. I really quite enjoyed it. I was surprised would by you? it. Would yeah. you? I'd give it a three. People are going to laugh at that. But I'd give it a three because <laughs> I just thought it was fine. It's worth a watch. Like, it's not awful. It's not badly done. It's just not great. I don't think it... I thought it was all right, actually. I thought it was good. I quite enjoyed it. I mean, it's weird watching a horror film at half seven on a Saturday morning. Yeah. It's a weird thing to do. Yeah, but I, I thought... Our neighbours must, must think we're really weird. Yeah, definitely. This really intense exorcism scene at like eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it must and be like, what very, the fuck? A very, we have a nice sit down conversation where we just review the movie that we've just watched <laughs> with no context. It must seem really yeah, weird. It must be a not find us really strange. No, I actually really liked it. I could, I just like kept wanting to have like spin offs with like the coach. So you, like, there's mm. there should be like a, a parallel film, which is a sports movie. Yeah, because the dad <laughs> is a basketball coach in yeah. the film. You give no context to that. Sorry, but the dad is basketball coach. But there should be like a parallel movie where he's like, the, it's a sports story, and the uh, the exorcism and the possession of the daughter is like a little subplot. You don't really get much much. Become a part of the Horton team. We're looking for welders, painters, assemblers, machine operators, cabinet makers, and other positions to build emergency vehicles that help save lives. Join us at our hiring event on Wednesday, January 18th from 2 to 5 p.m. at 3800 McDowell Road in Grove City. We offer a huge $1,500 sign-on bonus and great benefits such as 401k match, medical coverage starting day one, and much more. For more information on what Horton can do for you, visit careers.revgroup.com and search Grove City. So it kind of leads us into this week's story. Are we talking about basketball? Talking about basketball balls. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> no, we're talking about the Dybbuk box. What do you know about the Dybbuk box? Oh, Dan stands like, Dan's annoyed already. What do you know about the Dybbuk box? Uh, I So, there's, um, there's, I'm quite split in this because I think they're real things. I think they're as real as Catholic exorcisms are and I think there's a whole load of religious stuff to go with it but i also think there's now a cottage industry on ebay of fake Dybbuk boxes that are made so that youtubers can pay extortionate amounts of money for them and make a video well do you, do you know the origins of the story of the Dybbuk box no i don't I, okay all, my my only context for the Dybbuk box is what i've found out since zach got one okay so <laughs> i'm gonna this, our story today is the story of zach bagan's Dybbuk box. Oh, right. Okay, and where cool. that came from. Okay. But we're not going to be talking about Zach Bagans. We've said his name three times now. Yeah, so. but I'm just saying. Okay, so we're not allowed briefly, to say Briefly, it's like, it's like Bloody Mary. If we keep saying his name, he will appear <laughs> with his snap back hand going, dude, <laughs> around the house. Oh my God, that'd be so annoying. <laughs> this story is the original eBay description of the original Zach Bagans Dybbuk box. Oh, I didn't know it come from eBay. Yes, it did. I'm going to read it to you and then you can decide what you think okay. of it. All of the events that I'm about to set forth in this listing are accurate and may be verified by the winning bidder with the copies of hospital records and sworn affidavits that I'm including as part of the sale of the cabinet. During September of 2001, I attended an estate sale in Portland, Oregon. The items liquidated at this sale were from the estate of a woman who had passed away at the age of 103. A granddaughter of the woman told me that her grandmother had been born in Poland where she grew up, married, raised a family and lived until she was sent to a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. She was the only member of her family who survived the camp. Her parents, brothers, a sister, a husband and two sons and a daughter were all killed. She survived the camp by escaping with some other prisoners and somehow making her way to Spain where she lived until the end of the war. I was told that she acquired the small wine cabinet listed here in Spain and it was one of only three items that she brought with her when she immigrated to the United States. The other two items were a steamer trunk and a sewing box. 
I purchased the wine cabinet along with the sewing box and some other furniture at the estate sale. After the sale, I was approached by the woman's granddaughter who said, I see you got the Dybbuk box. She was referring to the wine cabinet. I asked her what a Dybbuk box was and she told me that when she was growing up, her grandmother always kept the wine cabinet in her sewing room. It was always shut and set in a place that was out of reach. The grandmother always called it the Dybbuk box. When the girl asked her grandmother what was inside, her grandmother spat three times through her fingers and said, a Dybbuk and Kesselim. The grandmother went on to tell the girl that the wine cabinet was never, ever to be opened. The granddaughter told me that her grandmother had asked that the box be buried with her. However, as such a request was contrary to the rules of an Orthodox Jewish burial, the grandmother's request had not been honoured. I asked the granddaughter what a Dybbuk and Kesselim were, but she didn't know. I asked if she would like to open it with me. She did not want to open it as her grandmother had been very serious when she instructed her not to do so and regardless of the reason, she wanted to honour her grandmother's request. I finally ended up offering to let her keep what seemed to be a sentimental keepsake. At that point, she was very insistent and said, no, no, you bought it, you keep it. I explained that I didn't want my money back and that it would make me feel better to do what I thought was an act of kindness. She then became somewhat upset. Looking back now, the way she became upset was just plain odd. She raised her voice to me and said again, You bought it. You made a deal. When I tried to speak, she yelled, We don't want it. She began to cry, asked me to leave and quickly walked away. I wrote the whole episode off to the stress and grief she must have been experiencing. I took my purchases and politely left. At the time when I bought the cabinet, I owned a small furniture refinishing business. I took the cabinet to my store and put it in my basement workshop where I intended to refinish it and give it as a gift to my mother. I didn't think anything more about it. Why are you laughing? <laughs> that would have been the worst gift to give to your mother. I've got a demon in a box. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Here's a demon in a box. Don't open it or do whichever you want. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> and that little Voldemort baby crawls out. <laughs> oh, I don't know where I was now. I'm going to refurbish it for his mum. Oh, yeah. I opened my shop for the day and went to run some errands, leaving the young woman who did sales for me in charge. After about half an hour, I got a call on my cell phone. The call was from my salesperson. She was absolutely hysterical and screaming that someone was in my workshop, breaking glass and swearing. Furthermore, the intruder had locked the iron security gates and the emergency exit so she couldn't get out. I told her to call the police and my cell phone battery went dead. I hit speeds of 100 miles an hour getting back to the shop. When I arrived, I found the gates locked. I went inside and found my employee on the floor in a corner of my office, sobbing hysterically. I ran to the basement and went downstairs. At the bottom of the stairs, I was hit by an overpowering, unmistakable odour of cat urine. There have never been any animals kept or found in my shop. The lights didn't work. As I investigated, I found that the reason the lights didn't work also explained the sound of the glass breaking. All of the light bulbs in the basement were broken. All nine incandescent bulbs had been broken in their sockets and ten four-foot fluorescent tubes were lying shattered on the floor. I did not find an intruder, however. I should also add that there was only one entrance to the basement. It would have been impossible for anyone to leave without meeting me head-on. I went back up to speak to my salesperson, but she had left. She never returned to work after having been with me for two years. She refused to discuss the incident and still refuses to this day. I never thought of relating the events of that day to having anything to do with the cabinet. Then, things got worse. As I already indicated, I decided to give the cabinet to my mother as a birthday gift. About two weeks after I made the purchase, I decided to start refinishing it. I was surprised to find that the cabinet had a unique little mechanism. When you open one of the doors, the mechanism causes the opposite door and the little drawer below to open at the same time. It was very well made. Inside the cabinet, I found the following items. One 1928 US wheat penny, a 1925 US wheat penny, one small lock of blonde hair bound with a string, one small lock of black or brown hair bound with a string, one small granite statue engraved and gilded with Hebrew letters. I've been told that the letters spell out one word, shalom, one dried rosebud, one golden wine cup, one very strange black cast iron candlestick holder with octopus legs. I saved all of the items in a box, intending to return them to the estate. The family has refused the items, so they will be included in the sale of this cabinet. 
After opening the cabinet, I decided not to refinish it. I cleaned it and rubbed in some lemon oil, and it was at this time I noticed that there was an inscription in Hebrew carved into the back of the cabinet. I have no idea what it says or if it is significant. I have included a picture of that inscription below. On my mother's birthday, October the 28th, 2001, my mother called to tell me that she was going out of town with my sister for three days, and we postponed celebrating her birthday together until she returned. On October 31st, 2001, convenient day, my mother came to my shop. We were going to have lunch together, but before we were going to leave, I gave her the wine cabinet. She seemed to like it. While she examined it, I went to make a phone call. I'd been out of sight more than five minutes when one of my employees came running into my office saying that something was wrong with my mum. When I went back to see what the matter was, I found my mum sitting in a chair beside the cabinet. Her face had no expression, but tears were streaming down her cheeks. No matter how I tried to get her to respond, she would not, and she could not. It turns out that my mother had suffered a stroke. She was taken to the hospital by ambulance. She ended up suffering partial paralysis and losing her ability to speak and form words. She has since regained the ability to speak. She could understand things being said to her and could respond by pointing letters of the alphabet to spell out words she wanted to say. When I asked her the following day what she was doing, she teared up and spelled out the words N-O-G-I-F-T. I assured her that I had given her a gift for her birthday, thinking that she didn't remember, but she became even more upset and spelled out the words H-A-T-E-G-I-F-T. I laughed and told her not to worry. I told her I was sorry she didn't like the cabinet and that I would get her anything she wanted if she would promise to get well soon. Still, I didn't associate anything that happened with the cabinet itself or anything paranormal. Frankly, I don't think I ever even used the term paranormal until this last month. I'll try to make this short now. I gave the cabinet to my sister. She kept it for a week and then gave it back. She complained that she couldn't get the doors to stay closed and that they kept opening up. There are no springs in the door mechanism and I've never found that the doors come open. I gave it to my brother and his wife who kept it for three days and then gave it back. My brother said it smelled like jasmine flowers but his wife insisted that it put out an odour of cat urine. I gave it to my girlfriend who then asked me to sell it for her after only two days. I sold it the same day to a nice middle-aged couple. Three days later when I came in to open the shop for the day I found the cabinet sitting at the front doors with a note that read This has bad darkness. I had no idea what it meant but I ended up taking it home. Okay, let's pause there for a second. If I'm trying to gift something to people (laughs) and a line of people keep this thing for a couple of days and then give it back. Paranormal or not, I wouldn't bring it home. Clearly nobody wants it. Clearly it's shite. (laughs) Clearly it smells like cat piss. Why would you want to bring it home then? Why is he so obsessed with it? He's a businessman. He's got to make so that he's got to, if he can't gift it to someone, then bloody leave it in your shop it. then and let it get sold. Yeah, but they keep bringing it back. <laughs> then things got even worse. Since the day I brought it home, I began having a strange, reoccurring nightmare. Every time I have the horrible dream, it goes something like this: I find myself walking with a friend, usually somebody I know well and trust. And at some point in the dream, I find myself looking to the looking into the eyes of the person that I am with. It is then that I realise that there is something different, something evil looking back at me. At that point in my dream, the person I am with changes into what can only be described as the most gruesome, demonic looking hag I have ever seen. This hag proceeds then to beat the living tar out of me. I have awakened numerous times to find bruises and marks on myself where I had been hit by the old woman during the previous night. Still, I never relate the nightmares to the cabinet, nor do I think that I ever would have. About a month ago, however, my sister and my brother and his wife came over to my house and spent the night. The following morning during breakfast, my sister complained that she had had a horrible nightmare. She said that she recalled having it a couple of times before, and she went on to describe my nightmare exactly to the last detail. My brother and his wife froze as they listened, and then chimed in that they had both had the exact same dreams that night as well. The hair was standing up on the back of my neck, and still is as I write this. As we talked, it became clear that the common denominator was that each of us had had the nightmare during the times that the cabinet was in our respective homes. I called my girlfriend and asked if she could recall having any nightmares recently. She described the same nightmare, same hag, same everything. When I asked her if she remembered the date when she had the nightmare, she said she did not. Then I asked if it happened to be the night before she gave me the cabinet back to sell for her. And she said, yeah, how did you know that? Since my family discussion, it seems like all hell is breaking loose. 
For a week afterward, I started seeing what I can only describe as shadow things in my peripheral vision. In fact, numerous visitors to my house have claimed that they've seen these shadow things too. I put the cabinet in an outside storage unit and was awakened when the smoke alarm in the unit went off in the middle of the night. When I went to see what was burning, I opened the door and didn't see any smoke. However, I did get hit with the smell of cat urine. When I went back inside, the smell was there in my house. I don't own a cat and I never have. I went back outside and grabbed the cabinet. I brought it back inside and tried to research it on the internet. While I was surfing the net, I fell asleep and once again I had the same nightmare. I woke up at around 4.30am when it felt and smelled like someone was breathing on my neck to find that my house now smells like jasmine flowers and just in time to see a huge shadow thing go loping down the hallway away from me. I would destroy this thing in a second except I really don't have any understanding of what I may or may not be dealing with. I am afraid, and I do mean afraid, that if I destroy this cabinet, whatever it is that seems to have come with it may just stay here with me. I've been told that there are people who shop on eBay that understand these kinds of things and specifically look for these kinds of items. If you are one of these people, please, please buy this cabinet and do whatever you do with a thing like this. Help me. You can see that I have no reserve price or minimum bid. If I can make things any easier, let me know and I will do everything within my abilities. One more note. On the same day my mum had her stroke, the lease to my store was summarily terminated without cause. All of the items that I originally found inside the cabinet are included in the sale and will be delivered with the cabinet. There is no way that I can respond to all the emails I've received since putting this thing online. I'll try now to update and answer the most common questions I've been receiving. I'm not religious. I do not wish to have or participate in any sort of exorcism or case study or photo sessions at my home. I will not sell any of the individual pieces which were originally found separate from the other pieces and the cabinet. I do not speak Hebrew, nor do I know what the word Kesselim means. I don't know what the word even is, or if it even is a Hebrew word. At the end of the auction, I've decided to take an opportunity to speak with the winning bidder for two reasons. One, to make sure that the winning bidder is a serious adult who has employed some valid reasoning skills to make a decision to accept whatever this is. I will not be judgmental. Do whatever you want or need after the sale. And two, to offer full details of the events that have transpired. After I've carried out these responsibilities and upon payment, I will have the cabinet and its contents delivered by whatever way the winning bidder wants. At that point, I would have no further involvement with this matter in any way, shape or form, period. To all of you that have offered to pray, I may not be religious, but I'm certainly open to the possibilities. No matter what your religion might be, thank you. No, I will not circumvent or make any deals outside of eBay, even for more money than the final auction price. If you want to win the auction and have the kind of money that some of you are offering, there shouldn't be any reason why you can't just simply place a bid in an open, honest fashion. I'm sure you understand why I might be suspicious. Also... For those of you wanting to know if I'm still experiencing anything out of the ordinary, I thought everything was going okay until I went home on Friday, the 13th of June, and found that all the fish in my aquarium, all 10 of them, were dead. I'm still hoping that all of this is coincidental. What are your thoughts so far? I'm a bit disappointed that Zach Bagans got his debit box off of eBay. He didn't. You just told me that was a story of his. That's not the rest of the story. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I so don't... That's the original post. Okay, yeah. Well, I just think, I agree with him about not destroying it, actually. Although that would be my temptation. It might not be the smartest move in the world. But, at the same point, if he was that keen to get rid of it to someone that would knew what to do with it, why the hell is it on eBay? Like, why is he trying to make any money out of it? Just give it away. If you don't want it anymore, get rid of it. Doesn't and people do sell transaction. haunted items on eBay. It was like when I wanted to buy the crying ch- child painting, I found one on eBay. And I looked up Dibby boxes and I was going to buy one for this episode. And you'll see why I was going to buy one after this. But I was going to buy one for this episode. And, um, I'm glad you didn't. Thanks. That's all right. I think didn't I might actually try and put like parental filters on all your laptops and your phones so that ebay is not somewhere you can go (laughs) but there are literally hundreds of listings for dibbic boxes on ebay but this one was the first one so the dibbic is a real thing in jewish mythology yeah i believe that but i just i I have have trouble with the the finite like the monetizing of it that is where i have my issues i think if you're that if you're experiencing all these weird things and all these people who told you that it's dark and you want to get rid of it, you, there are other ways to get rid of it other than making money from it. There's nothing in the law that he knows. He says he doesn't know anything about it. It's not like there has to be a transaction for it to pass on. He doesn't. There's other ways you could get rid of it. So what are you, are you thinking it's paranormal or not? I think because it's the first one, maybe. Um, maybe I'm just cross with him. 
<laughs> I just, just don't annoyed. think. I don't think. Yeah, I, I, I don't like. I, I can understand why he wants to keep his transactions on eBay because that's really shady. But actually, why is it on eBay in the first place? If you want rid of it, get rid of it. You don't need to pay money for it. Like nobody needs to buy it off you. Just Did I get tell rid you his name? By the way, no. His name is. Uh, I think it's Kevin Manis. Okay, Kevin, I'm cross with you. Yeah, Kevin. Dan doesn't like you. Do you have the final bid price out of interest? Do you want to hear the rest of the story? Yeah, but do you have how much it sold for? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. In June 2003, he sold it to a University of Missouri student named Losiv Nietzsche. Nietzsche put it back on sale on eBay eight months later, after he and his roommates suffered insomnia and illnesses in the presence of the dreaded item. Nietzsche was able to sell it for $280 to Jason Haxton, who had heard about it from a student who was also one of Nietzsche's roommates. Haxton claims to have experienced paranormal activity in the presence of the box, though he also states that it had an anti-aging effect on him. He claims that he experienced welts and hives when he first bought the box, and that he even experienced coughing up blood and choking. He has said touching it almost puts it into a liquid state. He relates that when he's had the box, he has seen strange lights and shadows. Nevertheless, Haxton has taken a rather intelligent and academic approach to understanding the box. He has enlisted the help of scientists, paranormalists, Kabbalists, Kabbalists, Kabbalists and Wiccans to put the box into a more manageable state so he can keep it. He believes the force contained in the cabinet is neutral but plays off who comes into contact with it. Its ultimate goal is to understand and reveal truth and that it was seeking the right owner to help it. For a time, Haxton kept the box secure in a wood arc lined with 24 karat gold and stashed it in his den to keep it subdued. However, more recently, he admitted that he ends up putting it into a military-grade shockproof container buried somewhere where it was well hidden and wouldn't be discovered. Zach Bagans, known for his work on the television show Ghost Adventures, ended up buying the Dibbit box from Jason Haxton. Bagans has the box as part of his collection of paranormal objects in his haunted museum in Las Vegas. Bagans will not let the public look at it. However, in order to see it, you must sign a waiver that releases Bagans from liability if anything bad happens to you while viewing the box or immediately after. Despite the strange occurrences that have happened to those who have come into contact with the box, there are many people who don't believe there's anything special about it. Many sceptics think that since the owners of the box believed it was cursed, they attributed their misfortunes to owning the box. Chris French of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit at Goldsmiths College expressed scepticism at the idea that the box is haunted or cursed, saying, The people were already primed to be looking out for bad stuff. If you believe you've been cursed, then inevitably you explain the bad stuff that happens in terms of what you perceive to be the cause. Put it like this, I'd be happy to own this object. While French does have a point, one cannot discount the strange events that have happened to every owner of the box since Kevin Manis. Zach Bagans bought the box for thousands. And thousands of dollars. So what do you think? Well, it's the object, isn't it? So there's providence to it. He's got a story for it. So it makes sense in terms of selling tickets to the museum. I don't like... I, I, oh, I don't know. Kabbalah is a, is a sect of Judaism, isn't it? Yeah. So it makes sense getting them in as well, I guess. I don't know. It's an interesting one. I like... You know that I like a demon. Not actually like him. I'm not friends with him, but I tend That's to like... It's a weird fetish, isn't it? Yeah. I tend to think that there's probably something in it as a thing. But it's just, it's the fact that it's changed hands for money every time. It's every just, time. It's, it's just a bit like, for... if it's that bad, you just want rid of it, don't you? You're not trying to... But then I discovered something more to this story. Can you stop doing this? Because I think it's the end and you're going to get an opportunity to talk and then there's something else to come. Okay. So there's a podcast co- called Skeptoid Podcast and I got this information from them. So thank you. Do you want to hear what's really interesting about this story? Yep. Every once in a while, there's a small local ghost story that's not very good. Or that even has an obvious commercial origin. That has no business becoming popular, but it does. The famous Dybbuk box is one such story. It went from a screenwriter's pen on eBay all the way to the Hollywood big screen. It is a story of a small antique wooden box designed to hold a few bottles of wine to which was attached a horror story going all the way back to the Holocaust. Whoever owned the box, it was said, experienced terrible disturbances for as long as that box was in their home. Why? Because according to the story, the wine box was inhabited by a dybbuk, said to be a tormented spirit come back from the dead. The whole idea of the box being inhabited by a dybbuk is nonsensical, according to what a dybbuk is supposed to be. The Encyclopedia Mythica describes it as a disembodied spirit possessing a living body that belongs to another soul, and usually talks from that person's mouth. An important 1914 Yiddish play, The Dybbuk, was about a spirit of a dead man who possessed the living body of the woman he had loved and had to be exorcised. 
The word comes from the Hebrew verb to cling. So a dibik is specifically a soul who clings to another. Nowhere in the folkloric literature is there a precedent for a dibik to be inhabiting a box or any other inanimate object. But of course we're talking definitions of folkloric terms, fictional by their very definition, so there's no reason why this particular dibik can't inhabit a wooden box if it wants to. And besides, the fact that folklore exists for a possessing spirit tells us nothing about whether or not factual events did indeed harass the owners of this box. The folklore is irrelevant to the question of whether or not this wine box did indeed cause the frightening disturbances attributed to it. Okay, just hold on one second. Yeah? So, the thing that concerned me ever so slightly is that this, there was a story about the lady who originally had the debit box that he bought it off of, the old lady that died. Okay? Yeah. She was survived the Holocaust. Inside the debit box were two 1928 coins from America. 1928 coins mm-hmm. from America. There's too many crossing over of genres here, like... I don't know, yeah. I'm very, I'm more sceptical now than I was. So there's more to it. Is this going to make me even more sceptical? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe not. I don't know. The item was sold for $140 in June 2003 to a buyer whose eBay name was Spasmolitic. It was not the explosive viral success that you might have thought it was at the time. Spasmolitic turned out to be a Missouri student by the name of Nietzsche. And he relisted the item on eBay eight months later saying that he blogged about his experiences after buying the box. I've no reason to doubt this, although I was unable to find any such blog. Nietzsche in his eBay listing wrote of problems like insomnia or illness among his college roommates, though was careful to add that they were likely coincidental. There were occasional strong odor, odors and he kept needing car repairs, though he did not offer an explanation as to why he mentioned his car repairs in a listing about the Dybbuk box, one might suspect that he was hoping it would be inferred as evidence that the box was haunting, and therefore more desirable on eBay. He concluded his listing not too differently from Manus, where he said, Anyhow, for personal reasons, I very strongly do not want this box anymore. I hope there's someone on eBay who will take this thing off my hands. I would just throw it away in the woods or something, but I know there has been some interest in the past. If it were me, a crappy old wine box that I didn't want would have been in the dumpster faster than you could blink. But Nietzsche managed to sell it for $280 in February 2004, exactly doubling his money. The buyer at the time was Haxton, a museum director still in Missouri. Interestingly, Haxton and Nietzsche lived in the exact same town, Kirksville, Missouri. Haxton says he heard about it at the online auction from one of his students who happened to be one of Nietzsche's plagued roommates. Even more interestingly, Haxton, whose eBay name at the time he bought it was Agetron, today says the Dybbuk box reversed his aging. I'm not sure what that means, but it might give some insight into his expectations of buying items associated with the supernatural. Haxton's ownership of the Dybbuk box has been the predominant one, as he's had it ever since 2004. He's probably the best-known owner and wrote the seminal book on it, the 2011 book The Dybbuk Box, and maintains the principal website dybbukbox.com. It was a 2003 live YouTube appearance in which he announced the anti-aging effects he believes the box conferred upon him and it was in the book that he described how the box afflicted him physically with problems such as hives, welts and coughing up blood. He does not offer any convincing explanations of why any of these health effects would be attributable to the box instead of to the causes that produce these effects in other people. Unfortunately for Kevin Manis and Jason Haxton, co-writing credits for the possession, the film, ended up not going to them. But to a freelance entertainment writer, Leslie Gornstein, who wrote up the tale in a short article for the Los Angeles Times in 2004. Haxton and Manis did both receive film credits for a production consultant, probably not what they were hoping for, but better than nothing. A few years later in 2007, Manis did successfully produce a pair of short films, The Miracle and The Pretty Pitchy Pine Tree. Nice, but not exactly Hollywood blockbusters. Haxton is still working at the music. What was that second film called? The Pretty Pitchy Pine Tree. <laughs> that well known classic. <laughs> One title. Haxton still works at the museum, and the book still sells reasonably well. When Gornstein wrote her article, she tried repeatedly to con- contact Nietzsche, but had no success. It's an unusual name, and the internet has basically no record of such a person outside of the references to the Dybbuk box canon. Wherever or whoever this neighbour of Jason Haxton's is, he's only the third known person to have had this old wine box in his possession. 
and with the evident disappearance of his blog, all that remains is the story on his eBay page. In fact, the eBay stories coupled with Haxton's claims in his book add up to a grand total of three people who ever had this box, all of whom wrote about it for money and none of whom ever produced a shred of evidence that it had any unusual properties. For me, the Dybbuk box is one of the weaker ghost stories out there, so long as you consider only what's known to have happened and take the fictionalised, dramatised, unevidenced retellings with the grain of salt they deserve. Isn't that really interesting? Yeah, it is. But I think, which is nice for me because normally I'm really easily hoodwinked, but it's like the money thing is always a a warning to me. Well, somebody said on, I think it might have been on Instagram or on Facebook. And Bagan's totally got punked, didn't he? Absolutely. (laughs) But like somebody said, when you look at a paranormal story or you look at any sort of story like this, who is benefiting? If somebody is benefiting from, I think it was about the Enfield poltergeist. Mm. Who is making money from this? And if somebody's making money, then it's n- not likely to be real. Yep. And we've seen... So the reason why I wanted to do a story on the Dybbuk box is because it's exploded in popularity in the last year. There are... If you go onto YouTube and type in like Dybbuk box opening, there are hundreds and hundreds of videos of people who open Dybbuk boxes and then go, oh my God, there's something in my house. Oh my God, this is in my Dybbuk box. And now my house is haunted. But all those videos have tens of thousands of views yeah, exactly. they're all established youtubers loads of people benefit from it when i said that from the start like it just doesn't make sense to me like i the thing that the thing that's like it just ruined the whole story completely is the fact that there's no it's not part of the right that the dibbuk box is a thing that they put the dibbuk in there's no route to it in no there's Judaism. no route to it at all so i mean the dibbuk it has its root, yeah, yeah, yeah. roots in judaism but it'll be like a gin and like demons in in christianity isn't yeah. it? it's all the same thing and like I, I, I still think that there's truth to that element of it. Yeah. It's the, so the whole box box thing is just a, it's just a fabrication. But Bagans, is, it's worth like the, the thing is, if there's life in it, it's worth the money to Bagans, isn't it? He's, I think he's a shrewd businessman. He knows what he's doing with that museum. But remember, they did a Halloween episode of Ghost Adventures where they spent the whole episode <laughs> trying to decide whether or not to open the fucking Dybbuk box, and then yeah. they don't. Yeah. But the, spoiler, they don't open the box. But they didn't say anything previously that it had been previously opened. If it's already been opened, like yeah, there's no thing, big that issue. That little Voldemort baby is knocking about somewhere. But if you're going, if you're going on the principle that, like, they like, said, so the, the, the fable is that the demon is is exercised, put in a box, and sealed in the box. When you unseal something the first time, they don't actually tend to go back in it. If you think about a caged animal, oh yeah, they're not going to be like if you're oh, in a not zoo, pop back in, and you let the lion out. The lion doesn't go back into the cage on its own accord, right? So, matey at the start opens the box. He tells you what's inside it. He's got all the little pieces. It's yeah. been opened. It ain't going back in. He's had, he says he's not religious. He's not had any religious people do anything to it. It's not going back in of its own accord. You bought an empty box, if that's the truth. It's not staying there, is it? Unless it's a haunted item, which we kind of spoke about before. And you don't know what trauma the item went through originally. Yeah, but no, but, yeah. none of the story of the Holocaust no. survivor can be can be verified no, at no. all. But so I is, reckon, my theory on this yeah. is that Kevin Manis and Jason Haxton know each other. Yeah. And they conjured up this story. And Kevin Manis had his furniture shop, got this old, probably is an old Jewish heirloom. Yeah. Like an old but, Jewish wine cabinet. And wine then is ceremonial in Judaism as well, isn't mm. it? In the same way as it is in Christianity. In, in, yeah. So they were like, oh, how can we make some money off this? And I imagine that, that Manis was trying to flip items on eBay. And then obviously as a screenwriter, he was like, if I can get enough interest around this item, then it will sell. And I think that Nietzsche was one of them. Yeah, just at multiple counts on mm-hmm. eBay. It's not that hard, is it, really? Mm-hmm. Bought the item, in inverted commas, and then Haxton ended up with it. They ended up, like, completely playing themselves. It's a long game, though, isn't it? It's the long mm-hmm. game. Because the, mon- the book will sell. People will buy the book at some point. But yeah. unfortunately, they didn't get the screenwriting because someone no, screwed them over. I know, livid. <laughs> but it's just, I just thought it was such an interesting story, and it... Um... It's a super interesting story, because actually, I was, oh, I'm, I'm freaked out by the potential of something like that, but I've always been freaked out from it, from the idea that it's part of practice so that it does happen in practice and actually the ones on ebay i wouldn't want you to buy it because it would freak me out but the fact that it's on ebay suggests to me that it's not yeah anyway so i've always felt that but now that i know there's not even a practice i'm just like well you no know, there's the basis for it is that a dybbuk is a demon that clings because i was it. gonna have like a really interesting conversation based off of it if you hadn't have just like destroyed the story because actually if you think about it like 
the desperation that the um, Jewish people must have gone through during the Holocaust. the Holocaust. And actually in times of desperation, if you have a strong faith in the supernatural anyway, it might lead you down paths that are not so safe. That you necessarily wouldn't have travelled. Yeah. And so you don't know what was conjured in that time. So if it was part of law, like if it was part of the right. Yeah. And actually that's how they, that's what they did once it was exercised. They sealed it in a box, which does sound quite religious, doesn't it? Without like, obviously we know it's not now, but it does sound like it could be a religious. Yeah. So they had like those certain items in the box and you seal it in the box and then, you know, you have to keep the box because you don't want to get into the wrong hands in case it gets opened, blah, 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 blah. So if it had come from that period, if the, if the, the origin of the box was that, that story, then actually you could, you could almost, you could almost create a better backstory than they did. So Kevin, if you want to hit me off, I'll help you out with that. (laughs) But there you go. So the Dybbuk box is 100% not a real thing. No, but the Dybbuks could be. Dybbuks are, Mm. because they, well, they are, because they exist in, in Jewish folklore. Yeah. But Dybbuk boxes, don't believe the hype, kiddos. If you see those videos on YouTube, just so don't watch them. When we eventually go to the Haunted Museum in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. no, Las Vegas, because there's not one in Los Angeles. So if we end up in the Haunted Museum in Los, Los Angeles, we're in the wrong place yes, and we need we to are. leave. I'm just going to sign that waiver and open a box in you. Yeah? Oh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just win and open it. I'll be like, let me sign that waiver, waiver. And he'll be like, oh, you can look at the box. And I'll just drop kick off the thing. I'll be like, there's no fucking Timmy box here. He'd be really annoyed. But yeah, and you'd be like, but then pay the, for the, the, cost the thing, is, well. thing is, is that actually none of the items in Zach Bagan's museum have any clout to them anyway. We've got two reviews this week. Hey. Review number one is from Hebe GB. That's a good name. I know. I love the Hebe GBs. And it's entitled Spooky and Irreverent and... No, Spooky and spooky Irreverent. irreverent. Sp- shh. Ruining it. Spooky and Irreverent and Fun. I don't know what Irreverent means. Look at your dictionary. You can look it up. That can be part of your functional skills English development. Okay, thank you. This is one of my most favourite podcasts. I love the spooky stories. I'm going to start watching the movies in the review and I love Emma's accent. I'm American, what can I say? If you two ever come to Salt Lake City, Utah, I'll take you on a ghost hunt. Everyone should be listening to this podcast. Five stars for sure. Thank you for the review. And I'd love to come to Salt Lake City, but I really don't want to go on a ghost hunt. Thank you for the invite, though. I'll go on the ghost hunt. I'll just go and look at the temple. You just you just go and have a drink or something, and I'll go on the ghost no, hunt. No, I think it's a dry state. Oh, is it? I think can you, can you fill us in, please, Heebie Is Utah a dry state? Review number two is from Pets... Pet Scow. And it's entitled My New Favourite Podcast. A healthy mixture of spooky humour, history, discussion and scepticism. Well, at least on Emma's part. <laughs> I'm Dan, a sceptic. Dan and Emma are <laughs> awesome. I highly recommend this podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, if you enjoyed this week's episode, can you please... I feel like I've been quite a sceptic recently. Yeah, you've been quite good. Yeah. I feel like you're growing as a human being. Well, you keep disproving everything I like to believe in. If you tell me Santa's not real, that's it. This podcast is over. We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so if you enjoyed this week's episode, can you please go and like our new Facebook page, which is called Real Life Ghost Stories. Join our Real Life Ghost Stories super secret group. Password is Emma and Dan. You can find us on Instagram at Real Life Ghost Stories podcast, I think. I don't really remember what our handle is. And on Twitter... At Real Ghost Pod. And you can also find us on Patreon, where we are creating more content than you get on a weekly basis. So if you're craving more episodes, then you need to donate to our Patreon so you can get four more extra episodes a month. Or some more, if the 50p baby club ever comes out. Oh yeah, come on Will, get a wriggle on. <laughs> and we shall see you next week. Bye. Bye.